Good afternoon and welcome to this IIEA webinar. For many people who get involved in economics, one of the main reasons for doing so are questions about why economies sometimes boom and sometimes stagnate, and why some are rich and some are poor. It is not an exaggeration to say that there is nobody on the planet who is more interesting and informed on these questions than our guest today, Professor Robert J. Gordon. During his presentation over the next 25 minutes or so, Bob will look at trends in productivity growth in Europe over the decades and draw some parallels with the United States. He will also look at how the pandemic has affected productivity trends and what sort of lasting, lasting impact there might be from the past 18 months and the changes it has brought about. Before taking your questions on these topics, and I am sure on some of the other big and burning questions in macroeconomics today, let me share a brief bio. Bob is Stanley G. Harris Professor in the Social Sciences and Professor of Economics at Northwestern University in the United States. His recent work on the rise and fall of American economic growth and the widening of US, the US income distribution have been widely cited. And in 2016, he was named one of Blue, Blue Bloomberg's top 50 most influential people in the world. He is author of The Rise and Fall of American Growth, the US Standard of Living Since the Civil War, published in 2016. He is also author of Macroeconomics, 12th, 12th edition, and the measurement of durable goods prices, the American business cycle, and the economics of new goods. Our speaker today is also a distinguished fellow of the American Economic Association and a fellow of both the Econometric Society and the American, American Academy of Arts and Science. The entire event today is on the record and my colleagues tell me to let you know to tweet to your heart's content at the handle at IIEA. With that, uh, over to our speaker today. Many thanks for joining us. We very much look forward to your presentation and the Q&A session afterwards. Delighted to be here. Let me uh, announce the title of my talk, The Transatlantic Productivity Slowdown. Europe chasing the American frontier. Uh, so let's uh, start by identifying what I mean by Europe. <clears throat> um, what we often call Western Europe uh, consists of the 15 nations uh, that were in the EU prior to its enlargement in 2004. So that includes all five of the big nations, UK, France, Germany, Italy, and Spain, and all, all the, um, uh, almost all of the uh, remaining Western European nations, except for Norway and Switzerland. We're going to compare the path of productivity growth over the post-war period <clears throat> for the EU 15 versus the United States. The time paths uh, look quite different, but there are some important similarities that I'm going to pull out. And to understand the slowdown, I'm going to both look at the usual way of decomposing the slowdown using growth accounting, uh, but I'm going to look at it in another way, which is a perhaps more novel and more interesting. And that is to ask, which were the industries that contributed to the slowdown? Were they the same industries in Europe and in the United States? So here, let's look at the uh, post-war history of productivity growth uh, in the United States. Uh, there are four eras that we can distinguish. This goes, these are five-year moving averages. So the dot you see here, uh, for 1955 is the average growth rate from 1951 to 55. Um, and you see that there is an era of strong productivity growth near 3% going up to the late 60s. Uh, then a slowdown from the early 70s through the mid 90s uh, at about one and a half percent. Then a very notable revival up to uh, almost back to 3% again uh, for the five year period ending in 2003 and then a very demonstrable slowdown uh, that uh, left us with productivity growth of only about half a percent uh, during the five years ending in the teens. There's been a revival in the last year and a half associated with the pandemic. Uh, we'll talk about that briefly at the end and uh, you may have questions you wanted to uh, forward to me about that. Uh, here's Europe, it looks quite different. Uh, Europe had very rapid productivity growth coming out of World War II. Uh, so over the five-year periods ending between 1955 and 1970, uh, productivity growth averaged around 5%, um, more than double the US during that period. Then there was a very rapid transition to a middle period 
uh, going from the uh, mid 70s through uh, the mid 90s uh, of about uh, two, two and a half percent. And then a uh, continuous slowdown uh, with only a slight hint of a revival uh, in the last year or two. If you put the US together with Europe, uh, you see that we had uh, a continuous period of Europe with faster growth, that is the level caught up to the US, as we'll see in a minute. Uh, then the US uh, sprinted ahead in growth uh, from the mid 1990s until the late uh, 2000s. And then both of them are, are tied uh, with mediocre growth uh, in the period of the teens. So just to summarize, Europe grew much faster from 1950 to 72. It was catching up for the dislocation in Europe caused by the interwar period and the two world wars when the United States was able more easily to exploit the new inventions uh, that I'll talk about later. Uh, inventions like the internal combustion engine and electricity. Europe slowed down, but I wanted to point out that during that 1972 to 95 slowdown period for Europe, uh, productivity growth was roughly similar to that in the early post-war period for the US. And I'm gonna make quite a bit of that uh, in a minute. Europe's productivity level caught up and exceeded the US in 1991 to 2002 and then fell behind again. Big mystery, why didn't Europe's growth rate respond to the digital revolution of the late 90s, as did the United States during that period when the United States went ahead? Here's the level of European productivity compared to the United States. Starting off only half the level of US productivity, catching up rapidly through the early 90s. Then Europe actually surged ahead briefly and then has fallen back. During the decade of the teens, uh, Europe was uh, stuck at about 90% of the US level of productivity. Um, and then it's turned down again with this US pandemic recovery. So uh, this might surprise you because often everybody thinks the US is way ahead in technology and productivity, but actually uh, Europe did manage to catch up and is still at around 90%. So not at all a bad performance. Now, was the slowdown mainly caused by a slump in investment or something about technology. Uh, the growth accounting technique used by economists uh, takes labor productivity growth output per hour, subtracts the contribution of what is called capital deepening. That's the growth of capital per unit of labor. And we also make an adjustment, usually a very minor one for changes in the age, sex, um, and education level of the labor force. Uh, when we do that, taking these uh, capital deepening and labor composition subtracted from labor productivity growth, and you get multi-factor productivity growth, which is the residual left over after we've included everything we can measure uh, and subtracted it out from pro measured productivity growth, we get this residual called multi-factor productivity growth. Uh, back in the 1950s, a famous economist called this the measure of our ignorance because we really don't know what's causing it, although it's usual to associate it with innovation and technology. Uh, so uh, looking at it with uh, labor productivity growth on the left side of the equation, uh, we can decompose labor productivity growth into three sources, the residual or multi-factor productivity growth, the capital deepening, and the labor uh, composition. So uh, taking these four eras that I designated for the US, fast, slow, fast, and then slow, uh, we can decompose uh, the sources of this productivity growth uh, into green for uh, total factor productivity growth or multi-factor productivity growth. Uh, purple is the capital deepening and the little orange section on the right is labor composition, which as you can see is the same in all four eras. So for the United States, uh, all the way up to 2005, we can conclude that investment was not part of the story. The purple area is about the same. The, all the ups and downs of labor productivity growth were caused by the green area of capital deepening. Then the slowdown in the uh, post 2005 period, and these data here only go up to 2015, but it would be very similar 
I continue to 2019, uh, that this last slowdown has been equally due to uh, slack investment that is capital deepening and a near disappearance in multi-factor productivity growth. Europe, as you can see, has had a steady slowdown from period one to two to three to four, um, not very different in the fourth period from the US. And as you can see for Europe, the blame for the slowdown is equally shared between slower investment in the purple area and slower factor multi-factor productivity growth. So it has completely disappeared um, by 2005 to 2015 uh, for the US almost disappeared. So uh, if we look at the uh, summary of the sources of growth analysis, uh, Changing multi-factor productivity growth is the big story for the United States in the first three intervals. And then capital deepening steps in to play a role in the final interval. Uh, in the European uh, group of 10, uh, the data on growth accounting here is for uh, the 10 biggest of the 15 countries. Uh, the steady slowdown is explained roughly equally by multi-factor productivity growth and capital deepening. Labor composition doesn't add much and it doesn't change much. Uh, so uh, the conclusion is if you ask why productivity growth has slowed down, it's only partly because of inadequate investment, that is the uh, decline in capital deepening. Um, now I wanted to highlight the similarity. Uh, here we have on a bar graph what we've just seen uh, in, in the previous slides, uh, the four eras of productivity growth with uh, dark red for the US and blue, of course, for Europe. Um, and I wanted to point out that in the early period, uh, the US had productivity growth roughly equal to Europe's growth in the second period. So you can say that in the first period, the US was really exploiting those inventions uh, that had been uh, developed before World War II. Uh, Europe was catching up to what the US already had. and uh, so Europe, running about 20, 25 years behind, had an experience between the early 70s and the mid 90s, very much like what the U.S. had had in the previous two decades. So if we take the slowdown from what I call the early period, 1950 to 72 for the U.S., 1972 to 95 for, for Europe, and compare it with the recent slow period, we get the arithmetic slowdown is exactly the same. Something very interesting that people have not pointed out. So US started ahead, Europe caught up. But if we take allowance for the early start of the US, the slowdown to the uh, decade of the teens was almost identical in both cases. Now, uh, if we compare the early period for the US with the second period for Europe, uh, we plot productivity growth for Europe in the vertical axis, productivity growth for the US on the horizontal axis. Uh, you can barely make out uh, a very dim blue line that looks like this, as you can see it right there. Uh, that's a 45 degree line. That would, uh, any dot like manufacturing that's right on the 45 degree line, that says that productivity growth in Europe was absolutely identical to that in the US. If we're down here for an industry like trade, wholesale and retail trade, uh, that says that productivity growth in Europe is lower than in the US. And anything above the 45 degree line, uh, like real estate, uh, productivity growth in Europe was faster uh, than in the US. So in this early period, we see a very great commonality in which industries are growing fast and slow. And interestingly, agriculture is the fastest and is right there on that 45 degree line. Uh, if we talk about what I call the early to late slowdown for the US, uh, if we look at the industries, this is how much they're contributing to the slowdown. Uh, and all the industries contributing to the slowdown in the US are producing goods rather than services with the single exception of wholesale and retail trade. And look at the big contribution being made by manufacturing. A common story that we may come back to is that manufacturing is really uh, at the heart of the slowdown story. It's a big sector and it slowed down a lot 
in both Europe and the US. So here's the same picture for Europe, more uniform slowdown spread across many industries, but for, uh, for Europe, all the uh, bottom five industries uh, in terms of the contribution of the slowdown are making goods rather than services. And again, manufacturing makes uh, by far the biggest contribution. Uh, if you want the list of which industries are contributing to the slowdown the most, uh, the list is the same for the US and Europe, except uh, retail and wholesale play more of a contribution for the US. That's because they started out faster uh, than in Europe. And in Europe, the professional administrative uh, sort of white collar services are making more of a contribution than in the US. But in common, we have that five out of the six industries contributing to the slowdown are producing commodities rather than uh, services. Now, what about the contribution to the, uh, this early to late slowdown? Uh, again, there's a 45 degree line, which looks like this. It's a very pale blue line. Anything lying along that would say it's exactly the same uh, in Europe and the US. So utilities, agriculture, transportation, manufacturing, education, all contributed about the same uh, to the slowdown in Europe. And when we see that uh, across the great institutional divide of the, trans of the Atlantic Ocean, we see so much uniformity across these industries, it really is a very uh, uh, prominent hypothesis that technology unique to each industry slowed down. And that's reflected in multi-factor productivity and the commonality across uh, the different industries in the two sides of the Atlantic. Uh, if you wanted to look at how much the uh, total factor productivity versus capital deepening mattered across industries, uh, here you see the, uh, the slowdown in total factor productivity indicated by the green bars outweighs the few industries where um, multi-factor productivity increased. And you see for the United States, a relatively small role for the slowdown in capital deepening. By the way, the outstanding industry in the United States for total factor productivity is mining, which is the fracking revolution of all that oil that's deep under the ground that's been discovered in the US uh, in the last 15 years. Uh, same picture for Europe. Uh, more of a contribution of capital deepening than is more of the purple bars are over on the left. And mining is doing very poorly in Europe where mining is mainly coal mining rather than uh, oil. So uh, the most important differences for the uh, Europe versus the US is really a uh, remarkable similarity in which industries are causing the slowdown, uh, uh, highlighting Retail and wholesale uh, started out faster in the US and mining is a leader in the US and a lagger in Europe. Now, uh, let's uh, explore some uh, hypotheses to explain the slowdown. I've already indicated, I think, that the, uh, the evolution of innovation uh, unique to each industry is uh, at the heart of the slowdown. But indeed, part of uh, Europe's catch up uh, was due to the catching up in educational attainment, which I'll show you in a second. Part of the European catch up was due to the massive reduction in hours worked per employee, uh, shedding less productive marginal hours. Europeans work hard when they're not on vacation. And of course, this decline in hours in Europe uh, came with the transition in most European countries to the generous four and five week vacations, which are unheard of in the United States, where uh, even paid vacations of two weeks are uh, not common. Uh, a final uh, idea is that the traditional division between MFP and capital deepening uh, may overstate the role of capital deepening. And I'm gonna explain that separately in a minute. Uh, here's the educational attainment uh, in years of schooling. Uh, Europe started out at five, uh, grades of schooling. The United States started out in the early post-war with eight and a half. The United States uh, extended high school education rapidly. There's a kink here. Uh, completion of high school uh, was reached pretty uniformly in the United States around 1980, while Europe was still catching up. 
So this catching up with European education is part of the reason that you are caught up uh, in the level of productivity. Uh, here are the hours of work per year, uh, starting off with Europeans working more than 2,000 hours per year or for more than 40 hours per week, but a very rapid decline in European hours per year as the vacations became um, uh, pervasive and as uh, Europe benefited from things like family leave that again are much less generous in the United States where hours per year uh, decline much more slowly. Uh, now here's this point about capital deepening exaggerating the effect uh, of investment. Uh, in the context of the popular uh, growth model associated with the name of Robert Solo, uh, in the long run, the ratio of capital to output uh, is constant. So that means that output per hour and capital per hour in the long run have to have the same growth rate. That means anything other than investment that reduces the growth of output per hour reduces the growth of capital per hour, i.e. investment. So there is a reverse feedback. If anything happens to slow down the impact of innovation, to make innovation a less powerful source of growth, then that's going to drag down growth and output, that's going to drag down growth and capital, and it's going to feed back to weak investment. And I think this is one of the reasons why investment has been so weak on both sides of the Atlantic in the last uh, 15 years. So uh, what is this idea that innovation is becoming less potent, less powerful? Uh, I like to go back to the great inventions of the late 19th century, sometimes called the second industrial revolution. Uh, and uh, they uh, are led above all by electricity and all of its uses in industry and in households and the internal combustion engine uh, making possible cars, trucks, uh, and air travel. Uh, chemicals and plastics also were part of the second industrial revolution. And uh, these industries uh, and the revolution of the uh, assembly line propelled US productivity from 1920 to 1970. And Europe, with a, about a two decade lag, uh, propelled its productivity growth from 1945 uh, to 1995. Uh, so that's the second industrial revolution. What about the third industrial revolution, the so-called information and communications technology revolution or ICT? Uh, Robert Solow, again, a name you've just heard, uh, looked at the data around 1987 and said in a memorable quote, we can see the computer age everywhere, but in the productivity statistics. And suddenly, uh, five years after Solo wrote, the productivity statistics began to reflect the big impact of the ICT revolution in boosting US productivity growth as we have seen, but not in Europe. Now, I've done a separate paper analyzing uh, what went wrong in Europe. And uh, the data tell us that the uh, EU fell behind the United States in this 1995 to 2005 period, both in producing ICT equipment and in using it. Productivity growth in producing ICT equipment during this 10 year interval was an unbelievable 17 and percent per year in the US versus only 5% in Europe. If we separate out industries uh, in the service sector that are intense users of ICT equipment, the US had much faster growth in these industries than did Europe. And uh, part of this is retailing in the United States with the famous big box stores that are much less common in Europe. There are much smaller differences across the Atlantic in industries that are not intensive in ICT use. A big puzzle, which I am not gonna to claim to have an answer to, is if the EU lagged behind in 1995 to 2005, why didn't they catch up after 2005? I think the financial crisis and the uh, turmoil in the European Union and the Euro uh, back in the early teens uh, had a lot to do with that. Uh, once again, the pale blue line that looks like this is a 45 degree line. If we plot uh, European versus American productivity growth in that a uh, revival decade of the late 1990s, early 2000s. We see that across the board, on average, this is a regression line. Europe had about half 
the productivity growth of the United States uh, and information and communications technology uh, up here, transportation and public uh, affairs were industries where Europe did uh, relatively well in terms of the use of technology, but manufacturing again, agriculture and trade uh, were doing relatively poorly in addition to these other industries down here below the line. So uh, these are the main conclusions I want to reach in the uh, formal part of my discussion. I've got some other slides to tell you if they become relevant in the uh, question and answer period. So the conclusions are that Europe started out at 50% of the level of US productivity, caught up by 1992 and fell back, especially in that decade of 1995 to 2005. In the most recent decade going up to 2019, the EU and US productivity grew less than 1% per year, uh, uniformly, not different. Uh, the common sources of the US and EU slowdown, uh, I think are the wearing out or using up of the innovation benefits of the second industrial revolution. And the big difference across the Atlantic is the greater exploitation of the US by the US of the third industrial revolution, the digital or ICT revolution, uh, particularly in the production of computer equipment, but also in the use of the ICT equipment. So I'll save for the discussion period uh, uh, some uh, reflections on what is happening uh, during the pandemic in the United States. And I can show you some uh, results about that as well. So thank you for your attention and I look forward to your questions. Thank you.